Heads-up displays have been an integral part of gaming since the very beginning of the medium. The HUD can transcribe any information the player may require in order to make progress through the game. Anything from Mario's coins to how much health your character has left to the location on your map can be shown through a HUD. While I think games now rely too heavily on their displays and distract from interesting gameplay mechanics and even sacrificing levels of immersion, I think interesting HUDs aren't given their due credit. So I'd like to look at what's done right, what's done wrong, and what could be done better. Going back to the earliest home console inception with the Magnavox Odyssey in 1973, the system was only really able to process a line and a couple of dots on screen. So where did this leave the games? What could you possibly do with that kind of technology? As much fun as a few rounds of Pong can be, a lot of designers relied on creating physical plastic sheets to indicate certain objectives and rules for the player to take note of, giving more room for players to fill in the blanks between a plastic sheet and some dots on screen. While this is an incredibly primitive form of game design, it shows the early beginnings of what a HUD can do for games, clearly displaying objectives in a way that allows for quick pick up and play sessions. As more early systems came out, we were done away with plastic sheets, but the displays weren't much more than digitally rendered equivalents except with maybe a score counter added into the mix. When gaming largely moved into the arcades by the late 70s, technology had made big enough leaps in such a seemingly short amount of time. Having dedicated machines for each game meant the ability to develop their respective cabinets, while the games themselves got crazier and crazier, needing to chew change throughout what would be known as the golden age of arcade gaming. The HUDs remain the same for the most part. From Asteroids to Donkey Kong, most of what was displayed was a life and score system pushed aside in the corners of the screen. Although simple, these two aspects would become a key staple on home gaming for many years to come. Home console gaming is where things get more and more complex, especially for the HUDs. And this is where we need to go over the different kinds of displays since we've well moved past the plastic sheets and high scores. According to Beyond the HUD, a thesis written by Eric Fagerholt, there are four types of heads-up display styles. Diegetic, where the interface is included within the game world and can be seen by both characters and players. Non-diegetic, only visible to players and removed from the in-game world. This is the most common form of a HUD. Spatial, elements of the display exist in the digital space, but are removed from the game world itself. Meta, displays existing in the game world, but not necessarily for the player, example being most uses of blood splatter on screen. So looking to Super Mario Bros, we can see both diegetic and Mario's different forms signaling his health and abilities, and non-diegetic with high scores, timer, plus everything else disconnected from the game world. The idea of having a diegetic display of Mario's health has traveled across all other core titles of the franchise, and can even be seen in other platformers like the Donkey Kong Country series on the SNES, where having just one Kong means one hit left, and two Kongs is that extra safety net. We can use more than just intrusive numbers, letters, and bars to send important information to players as they progress through games. While few games have opted for a completely diegetic display, one such example is Dead Space. Every facet of information you will need about the story, health, weapons, progression, or objectives are displayed through holographic images all visible to both Isaac, the game's protagonist, and the player, as if we were the ones actually embarking on the search and rescue mission aboard the spaceship Ishimura. Isaac's health is cleverly displayed on the back of his spacesuit, or rig as it's known, as well as the stasis resource. You have no ammo counter permanently displayed on screen. Instead, when aiming down the sights to shoot the limbs off a necromorph, a little holographic projection appears with their remaining plasma shots. Due to the mostly linear nature of Dead Space, rather than cramping up the screen with a clunky little mini-map directing Isaac around the Ishimura, instead developers opted for a far more elegant solution. With the press of a button, Isaac is able to project a beam of light on the ground, breadcrumbing him along to where he needs to go off to next. Other games used a similar mechanic to breadcrumbing in Dead Space, most notably Lionhead's Fable 2, released only one week later. These are two games that use a fundamentally similar idea that is the glowing trail, but executed in completely different ways. In Fable 2's case, it is not toggled on for a quick regathering of your bearings, but more serves as a permanent fixture in the world for an inbuilt diegetic display, unless of course the player opts to turn it off. The permanency of on or off is incredibly counterintuitive from a game design standpoint. It leaves no room for a sense of adventure. Instead, it acts more like a leash, designers are always gentle tugging at, pulling you in the direction they want you to go. This goes against the grain of that sense of adventure Lionhead boasted the game offers. The argument could be made that turning off the breadcrumbs can lead to a more satisfying adventure, but since Lionhead Studios also opted out of a minimap, it completely removes that ability. Unfortunately, Peter Molyneux was so adamant the permanent fixture of the breadcrumb trail was a good idea, the game wasn't designed with the feature turned off in mind. With long load times when pausing and bringing up the map and menus, it ends up far too disconnecting of an ordeal and really derails from any sense of adventuring. 
There's no single or combination of HUDs that are objectively better than the other. It's all about how designers play to the strengths of their games. Similarly, a HUD shouldn't affect gameplay directly. Imagine if Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door tried to have a fully diegetic interface. It simply wouldn't work, or at the very least lack the clarity in place of a false sense of immersion. A lot of the charm seen in the combat screens would be lost, losing what makes the game so beloved by many. It doesn't directly impact how the game is played, but instead adds to the completed package. Communication is key in a lot of games, especially those with complex battle systems like RPGs. If they were to go completely diegetic, information could be lost for the sake of trying to immerse players. Realism has its place, but with games like Paper Mario, immersion can take a backseat in place for the charm it brings to the table instead. Going back to Dead Space, the holographic displays don't change how you go about killing the necromorphs, rather just get you into the mindset of Isaac, giving the sense of realism that adds to the tension where it's warranted. Mirror's Edge's Runavision perfectly summarizes what a good spatial interface should look like. Clues directing Faith's movement around office building and rooftops of glass are all available in the digital space of the game, but don't exist to Faith herself. Similar spatial elements can be seen in Deus Ex Human Revolution, with the notorious yellow glow that plagues interactable items, which serves the opposite intended purpose of immersion, distracting players with the immediate knowledge of what can be interacted with, rather than giving a sense of freedom and exploration. When Retro took the reins of the Metroid franchise in form of the Prime series, they moved a completely non-diegetic HUD formed in the original game to Super Metroid and moved them into Samus's visor, while all aspects are visible to both the player and Samus, giving it a heavy diegetic interface, which allowed the majority of the game's story and lore to be explored through scanning. Some meta elements were introduced in the form of raindrops, frosted breath, and the space hunter's reflection during firefights. Having meta descriptions like this helped draw players into the isolation and eerie atmosphere the Retro games did so well. Sometimes meta representation like this can be cosmetic. A lot of times it can directly affect gameplay itself, such as low visibility in Uncharted games when Nathan Drake has taken too much damage, or when you get inked by those pesky bloopers in Mario Kart. Meta displays seem to step away from the rule of not being able to distract from gameplay directly, where the fourth wall breaking seems to add to gameplay rather than complement the mechanics of the game. From the early beginnings of putting plastic on your TV to the multitude of ways to display different information, HUDs are always changing the way developers look at their games, be it for a streamlined means of funneling through what is important to know to the player or to help create a deeper sense of immersion. It's good to note when games are pushing the boundaries of what is a very integral part of the overall gaming experience onto players in new and interesting ways.